God for that because uh, the number eight actually means number eight in the numerical uh, biblical uh, language means the day or a year of new beginnings. And uh, I believe that there's a new season for Amazing Grace Church. There's a new uh, things that God is going to do with us. And um, there is great joy, times of joy, times of revival, times of um, a great harvest that God is going to give us. So we thank God for that. And so I welcome you in the mighty name of Jesus. Everyone who is watching us live on Facebook, welcome. God bless you to Amazing Grace Church and Ministries and to our family uh, here and worldwide. We want to bless you in the name of the Lord. Well, we have been studying on the bane of hypocrisy for the uh, last couple of weeks in September. And um, I think we'll go on for a couple of weeks more till we complete the subject. And uh, in the past couple of weeks, we were talking about the vaccination <laughs> against hypocrisy. How can a church be vaccinated more than the COVID-19 vaccination, more than the flu vaccination, <laughs> or any other vaccination that the medical science has prescribed, we need the vaccination of God and the vaccinations against hypocrisy that it is not going to touch the body of Christ. And we must be above reproach when it comes to dishonesty, to deceit. We must come uh, above reproach when it comes to um, bigotry and to all kinds of pretense and uh, things that are highly displeasing to God. And we know that in our studies that, you know, God hates hypocrisy. You remember in the first church after the day of Pentecost, when the church was growing tremendously, thousands of people had come and Ananias and Sapphira fell dead because they pretended that they brought in all the offerings and they made it look like, you know, the making it look like is something which God hates because he's a God of honesty. <laughs> he, there is no lies in him. Um, he can never lie, the Bible says. And so he desires that we, the church, we, the sons and daughters of God, be also uh, emulate or rather uh, let the character of Christ be formed within us to such great extent that we will not be the same, but we will become like Jesus, that we'll be transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, uh, you know, my brother Sanjay was mentioning that it's not only what we believe, but we belong. If you know that you belong, then it becomes your uh, responsibility from duty to delight. You know, you don't serve God out of duty, but you serve God out of delight. And the Bible uh, has given a promise to that in the book of Psalms 37, 4 and 5. Delight in the Lord also, and he will grant you the desires of your heart. So I believe when you delightfully serve God, when you delightfully worship God, when you willingly uh, give, when you willingly labor in the house of God, that brings pleasure to the heart of God. And what he does is he pronounces a blessing upon him. He says, come into your ways unto the Lord. The next verse says, and he shall establish your paths. That's what the Bible says. So if you want your paths to be established, your future to be established, then take pleasure in the Lord, take delight in the Lord, take delight in his word and God will honor you. And I liked what brother David mentioned. And he said that, you know, we have to move on from the place of remorse to the place of repentance. And we, you know, on the Yom, of Kipp or Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, we repented of our sin. Uh, but a lot of time we do not really uh, fathom or realize that the Lord has actually forgiven us of all our sins. And we still live in that state of condemnation and guilt that haunts us again and again and again. And we are unable to get out of it. And that happens because of unbelief. Let me tell you, if you are living under guilt and condemnation, that happens because of unbelief, not believing that the Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven your sins. And it is imperative that we move from remorse to repentance. You see, um, David moved from remorse to repentance and God had mercy upon him, right? And God blessed David. And But Judas did not. He lived in remorse and took his life. 
And so remember, uh, <clears throat> if you are living in a state of remorse, get out of that, shake it out from your mind, because the devil is all out to destroy you, all out to kill you, so that you will be isolated from the fellowship of the saints, then you are gone away, and then you know you become an easy prey to Satan. And so it's very important that we understand that. Now, uh, hypocrisy is something that God hates, and we can only be delivered by the power of the word, by the power of the blood, and by the power of the Holy Ghost. We need all three working in tandem to be delivered from the sin of hypocrisy. Are you, are you with me? From the sin of cheating, from the sin of lying, from the sin of pretense, from the sin of bigotry, from the sin of self-righteous pride. And those are the places that you and I are called to um, shake it off. And we are called to do something that the Lord desires us to be in that place and position that we can overcome that and walk in holiness unto the Lord. Now, you see, when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and you were water baptized and the Holy Spirit filled, the Lord removed everything old that was in you. And he gave you a brand new. He made you brand new in him. And if you can have that belonging and that identity that I'm brand new in Jesus Christ, then the things of the old, the things of the flesh, the things of the world, the things of evil and demonic things will not persuade us or operate through us. Why? Because we have done due diligence in mortifying the works of our flesh. That means in putting to death the work of our flesh. We cooperate with God and crucify ourselves with Jesus. Allow the spirit of God to say, Lord, take my life and I want to surrender to you. And I want to nail it on the cross of Calvary. That's what Jesus has done. But every day we must mortify our flesh. The Bible records in the book of Romans. And so it's imperative that we live by that. So we have studied about a couple of four vaccinations. Number one is choose to be holy. Number three, uh, two is abide in Jesus Christ always. Number three is what? Ask God to fill your heart with love. Very, very important. Fourth, we studied was renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Praise the Lord. Now, fifth, today I'm going to talk to you about is very, very important. Beware of seducing spirits. Beware of seducing spirits. Now, that's very, very important aspect that I'm going to talk to you about. But before I uh, talk about seducing spirits, let me just throw in on something of integrity because in our last week word, we were focused on integrity. And in the book of Psalms chapter 41 is a very beautiful Psalm when David was going through a harrowing experience personally because uh, probably his son Absalom was dead. He was afflicted in his body. He was suffering with disease. And then we find in the book of Psalms, you can read it at home, uh, complete chapters are very few, only few verses, 13 verses are there. But he says something. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. What is he saying? He's not saying heal my spirit because his spirit was already regenerated. He did not say heal my body. But he's saying, Lord, heal my soul, heal my mind. That's his prayer that he is making unto the Lord. For I have sinned against you. Why he was saying that? Because when David was in distress, when he was in despair, when he was um, sorrowing for the loss of his son, and when he was afflicted with all forms of enemies all around him, he was talking about this prayer to the Lord. Lord, have mercy upon me. Forgive me of my sin that I have imagined and thought in my mind. Remember, every negative thinking, every evil thinking, every sinful thinking, he said, Lord, for I have sinned against you. So he was saying, Lord, in my thoughts, I have grieved your Holy Spirit. In my, um, my processing of the thoughts, I have not honored you, God. 
And therefore, I pray that you will forgive me. You know why? Because he could understand what Prophet Isaiah had written. Right in the book of Isaiah chapter 53, he, Prophet Isaiah talks about the sacrifice of Jesus. He said he poured out his soul unto death so that your and my soul will live. Praise God. Jesus poured out his soul. He did not only give his spirit, but he poured out his soul unto death. And his body was beaten and bruised and killed. Right? So in all three areas, that is his spirit, his soul, and his body, Jesus died a complete. Are you with me? And so he says, I commit my spirit unto you. I have finished my work. So Jesus was talking about, uh, about pouring out his soul. So he poured out his soul so that your soul and my soul will live. My mind will be renewed. Your mind will be renewed. You will live by the power of the word of God. Right? And then further on, he says, because there were his friends who was eating with him, friends who were uh, breaking bread with him, who were very his close associates. And he writes about them and which is uh, very, uh, if you are in a state of uh, a place where people have betrayed you, let me just remind you church, if, if you think that people have betrayed you, remember ever since you were born till now, there will be people who will betray you. Even today, you may be in a state of betrayal. Are you with me? Now, this betrayal comes from the power of deception, from the power of hypocrisy. Now, he talks about, yes, Lord, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat off my bread, had lifted up his heel against me. So, you know, you have gone through betrayal. I have gone through betrayal. I may still be going through betrayal by some of my own very precious people who say they love me, but behind my back, they are scheming against me, right? You may have the same scenario. They may say outwardly that they love you and they care about you, but inside of their heart, they want to kill you. And they are lifting up the heel against. What does the lifting up the heel signify? Lifting up the heel means they do not represent you correctly. They character assassinate you deliberately. They slander your name. They put false accusations against you. Because you were the closest friend to David. So this guy went around talking about the things. If you read down further in that, in that chapter, you will find that he went around like a, a gossiper talking about the intimate things and intricate things of David's life because he was his closest friend. And he misrepresented David's character to the world outside. So he is very, very hurt. He's very betrayed and then he makes a prayer unto the Lord. So you can take an encouragement from this because in the house of God, there may be people or there can be people who will betray you. Now outside, I'm not talking about outside world. Outside world is evil. Outside world lives in deception. Outside world is under the power of Satan. But I'm talking to the church of Jesus Christ. I'm talking to the people who are washed by the blood of the Lamb. These are the people whom you're eating with. They are also washed by the blood of the lamb. They are your friends, but they don't have your best interest in their heart concerning your life, concerning your welfare and concerning your future. And these are the people who lift up the heel against you and they talk against you. They talk against your integrity. They talk against your uh, character and they tarnish your name without understanding the consequences, right? But then he goes down further. He says, but thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me. Now, what is he doing? When his closest friend has betrayed David, he's lifting up his voice to the Lord. That's what we are called to do, my dear brothers and sisters, because even your closest can betray you, right? The closest, as my brother David was saying, that the closest of Jesus who kept the money back, who was the treasurer of Jesus's ministry, who was a thief, we used to rob from Jesus's bag. Are you with me? From the ministry bag. And it's not that Jesus did not know, knew him, knew his evil. Jesus knew him inside out. But yet Jesus chose to love him. Yet Jesus chose to pray for him. Yet Jesus chose to wash his feet. Yet Jesus chose to forgive him. But in spite of Jesus's generosity of love, this man Judas did not come to a realization the sacrificial love of Jesus. Still he went ahead 
and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And the Bible records that guilt and remorse filled his heart and his mind and he killed himself. So what David is doing in this scenario, right? What Jesus was doing, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Hallelujah. If you are betrayed, if I am betrayed, my and your responsibility is to lift up our eyes to heaven and say, God, Father, forgive them. Whoever is talking against the church, whoever is misrepresenting the church, whoever is a, a, a Lord character assassinating the leadership, Lord, forgive them. Whoever, maybe the closest friend, you probably have eaten with me, but you are backstabbing me. Maybe the same with you, my dear brothers and sisters. So we must lift up our voice to the Lord. And he said, Lord, raise me up that I may require them. Now, he's not saying that he wants to take revenge. But when you will lift him up, Lord, my name and my character and my reputation is in your hands. You will protect it. You will bless it so that the people who have talked against me, they will be ashamed. That is what he's saying, including his closest friend. By this, I know that thou favorest me because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. My dear brothers and sisters, you have been betrayed ever since you were born. I was betrayed ever since I was born. And that betrayal is the part and the character of a human nature, which has not been reborn by the power of the Holy Ghost. And therefore, we must overcome it by the power of the spirit. Right. But woe unto them. Woe unto them. Jesus said in the synoptic gospels, woe unto them through which they become a stumbling block through the sheep of the church or to your brother or to your sister by your living, by your pretense, by your hypocrisy. If you have become a stumbling block, the Bible says, Jesus says, woe unto him that a millstone should be hanged upon his head and he should be dumped into the sea that he cannot come back to even take a breath back. That's what is the curse that Jesus puts upon people who are a stumbling block for either your life or somebody else's life and there's a woe a curse pronounced by jesus now you say hey pastor you know the curses were in the old testament sir the curses are also in the new testament woe to them those who are a stumbling block to the little ones to the little ones to the sheep to the innocent ones my dear brothers and sisters we cannot play god we cannot play church in the house of god we must be the church we must believe and we must belong because otherwise the wrath of God comes upon us. So there we find there, he said, Lord, give me favor because my enemy doth not triumph over me. And as for me, he says, very beautiful verse, as for me, thou upholdest me in mine integrity. See that 12th verse, thou upholdest me in mine integrity. And settest me before thy face forever. He says, because of my integrity, O Lord, I have an audience in the presence of the Father. Hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, when you are a man without guile, you're a man without hypocrisy. You're a man without sin. You're a man without lying and cheating and slander and accusation. You will have an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You will never be bereft of the presence of God. You know why? You will never be dry. You will not be sodden. You will not be lazy. You will not be dried out tree. You will be evergreen, always producing fruit in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, that's what Apostle, Paul, uh, sorry, David is writing about and he talks about. So let's move on from that place. And the fifth point that we'll focus today is the seducing spirits, seducing spirits. How come this familiar friend or how come this friend who ate with David's plate was influenced wrongly concerning his own friend, David, the king? Can you imagine David, the warrior, David, the anointed one, David, the king, David, the one through whom the seed of Jesus is going to come. The seed of Messiah is going to come. Can you imagine? You are eating food with the most anointed man. You are breaking bread with the most anointed man. You are breaking uh, and, and dwelling with him, knowing everything about him. But yet this friend has the audacity to talk against you. That's what he was doing. And, and, and make a hole in the plate in which he was eating. Right? That's what David is saying. 
how that ha could happen can you imagine how could that happen where you were saying oh pastor sam your word was so fantastic hallelujah praise the lord then after that i don't see you today in the church what happened to you what stopped you what stopped you hearing the man of god what stopped you hearing your sister your brother in the house of god why has that division come in or that schism has come in, in your mind because there were operational seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in the church remember that in the church when paul was writing to the to the to the people right so he was talking about the seducing spirits and my dear brothers and sisters you and i must understand uh, that paul was interested that the church will grow in the knowledge of the will and understanding of god and he was constantly dealing with heresy constantly dealing with with false teachers prophets divisions in the church all his churches that he planted he was grappling with that and he was grappling with with demons that were manifesting through the known people through the so called jewish christians who were polluting the mind of the people of god in the church so let's see the word seduce what does it actually mean the word seduce is actually mean the dictionary meaning is to lead astray as from duty rectitude or the like corrupt to lead astray what the spirit does what the demonic spirit does how can this demonic spirit operate through an anointed man and a woman of god is a good question for you and me to ask how can because what happens is there are weak areas in all of us and what happens is that if we do not overcome those weak areas by the power of the word and by the power of the holy spirit the enemy comes in to use that weak area and gain entrance in us so what happens is we are anointed we are born again we are water baptized but now the pollution has started because there is an influence of a demon in your psyche in your mind he talks negative you swallow the negative he speaks neg he calls you to imagine negative you swallow the negative you take it down as deep muscles without checking that negative through the word of god you just swallow it like choice morsel and it becomes bitterness in your spirit in your belly and when your heart is belly uh, is bitter when your belly is bitter then whatever you speak becomes bitter because you have taken that seed if a uh, you know now the demon will not come directly to you but the demon will come through another brother or sister who is probably looks all familiar to you tongue talking prophesying you know moving in the gifts of the holy spirit supernatural manifestation but yet deception in the heart that's why jesus said in that day i will not i will say i don't need you, know you depart from me me you all e evil doers why they'll say oh lord we prophesied in your name he said i don't know you we heal the sick in your name i don't know you why you operated in your gifting but your heart was still corrupt it was influenced by demons rather than it becoming influenced by the holy spirit so to lead astray the word seduce or seducing means as from duty rectitude or the like corrupt to lead or draw away from principles faith or allegiance allegiance come on you know you say oh pastor you know people will come and go no 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 when god brings you he plants you in the body of christ we are the members of one another members you cannot cut yourself and think you'll be all healed and the body will not have pain if a small member of the body is cut what happens is the whole body feels pain my dear brothers and sisters so this church is not an worldly organization that people can come recruited and then they can go and leave their services terminated and they leave no sir when god plants you into a body when god you find your place in your body you cannot just think that you'll cut yourself right are you with me if you are sinning if your hand sins then literally you cut it out don't enter into heaven with a sinning hand that's what jesus was saying but if you speak spiritually jesus is saying you are part of the body 
You may be the eyes, you may be the nose, you may be the mouth, you may be the ears, you may be the hands, you may be the feet. Now you are part of the body. Jesus is the head of the church. So you are a living organism. You are not a living organization. So get that over, that organization from your mind. My dear brothers and sisters, yes, everything must be done in divine order in the house of God. Therefore, there are rules and regulations and therefore there are uh, the, uh, the, the understanding of how we operate. We have the Bible as a manual to operate. We don't cross that, but we are part of one another. We cannot cut ourselves and say, oh, my season has changed, I'm going. No, sir, that's a falsehood. That's a falsity and uh, something that God has not called you to. Let me tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, because we are part of one body of Jesus Christ. If you cannot love your brother whom you have seen, and if you cannot love your sister whom you interact with and probably eat bread with, how can you love God whom you have not seen? Your faith is deceptive and your confession is deception. If you say, I love God and I don't have, care about the church, then you are standing on a shaky ground. You are not standing on the truth of the word of God, my dear brothers and sisters, right? So the word seduces to win over, to attract, entice, entice with what? With your things, my dear brothers and sisters. And that's why you and I must be very, very careful. This word seduce in Greek means sorcerer, sorcerer. It is linked to occult and divination. That's why today that new age philosophy that has come that you'll only move under the supernatural discounting the word of God is from the pit of hell. You may start right, but you don't end right because you just want to fly away. God says, hey, fly within the boundaries of the word of God. That's true freedom. Freedom is not what I want to do. Freedom is what I ought to do. And that is imperative for us to understand. So let's look into the scripture, what the Bible is saying. Paul is writing to 1 Timothy. Now his protege, who is a pastor of the church. Now, this church was planted by Paul. And later on, Timothy was appointed as a pastor of the church. Because for a period of time, this church had no pastor. And only elders were governing the church. So now the young man, Timothy, has been brought and placed there. And remember... Timothy was, ridic was being ridiculed by the older men and women in the church. They said, hey, how can this young man teach us? And how can we come under the authority of this young pastor? Because he's just a boy. Let me tell you, in the times of the Jewish period, in the Greek period, you were still a boy till the age 40. You were not given any public responsibility until and unless you become 40 years of age. You were called and termed as a boy. Are you with me? Hello, good morning, good afternoon, people of God. You were called a boy. You were thought and looked upon as a boy that he is immature, not yet seasoned to come in a public office. But now Timothy was probably between 30 and 40 years of age and he was appointed as a pastor by, by Paul of this church. And so the elders looked disdainfully upon this young man and they used to ridicule him. That's why in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse uh, 7 it says, um, he says, God has not given to you the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of sound mind. What Paul was telling is, hey Timothy, rise up. Understand your calling. Understand your anointing. Understand uh, in what position you have been placed. It's a position of public office. No man is positioned in that place at that age below 40. In the times of the Hebrews and the Greek. Because that man was only a, a boy in the, in the Greek terminology. My dear brothers and sisters. So that, that man was being encouraged. And was being blessed. And was being mentored. And coached by Apostle Paul. Who was his father in faith. And so he was blessing him. So he says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 2. Now the Holy Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. It is not talking to the world outside. The people outside the church are already in the world. Satan is their master. He's not talking about that. He's talking about in the church. Now the Holy Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, these times, some shall depart from the faith, from the faith. 
giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils that comes from, I'm adding that, paraphrasing it, from familiar friends. <laughs> the friends that you eat with, friends you go on a picnic with, friends you have been praying with, those seducing spirits operate through them and they speak into you what? They speak lies and hypocrisy. They speak lies. They partner with their father, the devil, because he is the father of lies. They are not partnering with God. They are not verifying the scripture. They are not verifying the character of David. They are not verifying the, the life of David. They are not standing for the truth of what David stands for. They are not protecting David's anointing. What they are doing is deliberately speak lies in hypocrisy. With a mask, they eat with you. They say, oh, the food was very lovely. Afterwards, they say, you know, the salt was missing in that biryani. You know, but why did you say that biryani was very tasty? That's hypocrisy. If you can't appreciate genuinely from the heart, don't. Stay silent, but just don't blabber because you want to look good in the eyes of the person who fed you a good meal. My dear brothers and sisters, speaking lies and hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now remember that searing doesn't happen once. If you're seared once, you will immediately retract and say, oh my God, I'm hurting. I've been seared by a hot iron. But this iron is little warm, then it becomes a little warmer, then becomes a little more hotter, and that little by little by little by little influence of the demonic spirits and the doctrines of devils, and the gossips, and the lies, and the slander, it does what? It sears your conscience. Now you become like the devil himself. You are a child of God. You are still talking in tongues. You are still moving in the gifting. You are still preaching and teaching the word of God. You are doing all that you can do in your capacity to look good in the eyes of the people, but your conscience has been seared because you have not been able to change that leopard spot from your character. And that's one challenge that the church of Jesus Christ was facing. Right? Let's go to the book of Philippians. Chapter 3, verses 2, verses 18 and verses 19. Philippians chapter 3. All right? Paul is writing the same thing he was grappling there. Of false teachers. Beware of dogs. <laughs> Can you imagine he's writing to the church at Philippi? Beware of dogs. Dogs were in the church. What are dogs? Oh, they'll eat and they'll vomit and they'll eat the vomit. That's a dogs. And that's what he's saying. Beware of dogs who are inside you in the church, in your family, amongst your people whom you interact with. Okay, now these are Paul's word is that the Holy Spirit words. Don't get angry with me. That you may think I'm calling you a dog. Please, I'm not calling you a dog. You are lovely, lovely sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't become a wolf in a sheep. Sheep's clothing. My dear brothers and sisters, so it says beware of dogs. They repent and repent and they keep by eating back the woman. Then again, they'll repent and again, they'll eat back. The character never changes. A dog remains a dog. That's what he's saying. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers, evil workers in the church. Beware of the concession. Why saying beware of the concession? Because there were Jewish believers in the Philippi church that were insisting that all the Gentiles must be circumcised of the foreskin. That they should live by the law of circumcision and the laws of Moses. They did not understand that in the Old Testament in the Torah, the law of the circumcision was the circumcision of the heart. As mentioned in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And they did not understand the scriptures. So they were insisting in the church at Philippi, at, uh, to the Philippian church, that so he's warning them of three people, three categories, dogs, evil workers, concession. They are born again Jewish believers. They are Holy Spirit Jewish believers. They are probably moving in the gifting of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, they bring in seductive, seducive doctrine that is unethical, unbiblical, and uh, the church swallows it. If you have swallowed a wrong doctrine and a wrong teaching, 
please be careful, my dear brothers and sisters. It may have come to you from a very anointed person or persons, brothers or sisters, maybe leaders and maybe pastors, and probably you have got it wrong and you have not been like the Bereans from the book of Acts who could verify the teaching and the preaching of Peter and Paul. It is a responsibility in these end time days that we will become the men and the women of the word. So the dogs and the evil workers and the people of the concession will not take us away. And he says further down in verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. People living with you, people eating with you are probably enemies of the cross of Christ. Therefore, we must repent. Don't live in a place of remorse. You must repent. We must repent as a church. Otherwise, we will not be able to progress. Israel could not progress further because of one man's sin. He was Achan who stole some covetous things from the camp of the enemies and hid it in the ground. Till he was stoned to death, Israel did not prosper. My dear brothers and sisters, don't become that Achan and don't become that Ananias and Sapphira because of which you will become a stumbling block and a hindrance to the growth and the progress of the church of Jesus Christ locally and internationally. Verse 19, he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Achan's God was their belly, was his belly, my dear brothers and sisters. Whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things. So Achan was mindful of earthly things. Little gold, little silver, little robe. He dug a ground, hid it. Till he was brought out. Sin was found. Sin was destroyed. Then and only then there was progress. If you want real progress. And real growth. You know, people say, Pastor, I'm not growing. Check your heart. Oh, I am feel suffocated. Check your life. You know why? Because there is some sin in your heart that is hindering your personal growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Just by you getting a title or a position of a leadership or getting a pulpit to preach the word or do something in the house of God doesn't mean that you are growing. Your personal growth happens on a daily basis, when you pray, read the word, examine your heart, do the work, what the Lord has called you to do. Then you grow in the Lord God Almighty. Are you with me? So he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Achan's God was his belly. Covetousness, greed. He wanted something out of that war. He wanted something for himself personally. Many people today, they want something for them personally in the church. Oh, you know, pastor, I've been 10 years in the church. I've done nothing in the house of God. And you know, you have neglected me. Maybe I have neglected you, brother, but God has not neglected you. God will see you. He lifts you up. I cannot lift you up. The elders cannot lift you up. Only God lifts you up. Your actual real promotion comes forth from God. So let God lift you up. And I promise you, when God lifts you up, no demon of hell and no power of man can stop your growth and your lifting up. Hallelujah. So check your heart. Examine your heart. Every week in and week out as Amazing Grace Church worldwide, we come and break bread together. Let us not do it hypocritically and invoke the wrath of God upon us, but let us do it genuinely with a repentant heart so that times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord God Almighty, my dear brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. So Achan minded the earthly things. He was mindful of earthly things. Ananias and Sapphira was mindful of their status, my dear brothers and sisters. So you and I must not be mindful of our status. Oh, how will I look? Can I wear a mask of deception? Oh, I look holy, holy, holy. But inside there is knife and there is pistols, and there is bitterness, and there is vomit that you're emerging and doing so that it is not bringing blessing into the house of God. Let's go further down in next, next scripture, book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 5 and verse 13. Again, 
Paul is talking about, about these people. All right. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you see from verse 1 onward, he says, perilous times are coming. Dangerous times are coming. And I'm quickly opening that scripture uh, with us right now that we can understand what Paul is writing to his protege. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, this Know also, it's not there on the screen, but follow with follow me, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. The word perilous means treacherous times, dangerous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers, uh, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truce breakers. You made a covenant with God. You made a covenant with God's people. You have broken the truce. Right? And then he says, false accusers. Falsely they will accuse you. That's what the familiar friend of David was doing against David. Falsely accusing that anointed man of God. Incontinent. Never satisfied. Always curious to know more. Are you with? Fears. Despisers of those that are good. <laughs> despises of those of good people right they hang along with their kind of people so their cliqueishness within the house of God and that's what God hates cliqueishness oh I like my kind of people I like that kind of people I will hang around with only these people no 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 you can never think internationally when you're living in your well like a frog only can see the four walls of the well cannot see outside no sir God has given you a vision. He told to Abraham, look as far as possible. As far as possible, Abraham. Look that land I want to give you. God wants to give you as far as possible all the continents of the world. But we are still living in a well of despair and discouragement and doubts and slander and accusation. Living there only, drinking those same poisonous waters and polluting ourselves and polluting others. What a shame. We must repent. If you have been partners like that, repent. Why? Otherwise, the curse of God and the wrath of God will come upon you. And I'm talking collectively as a body of Christ. Why? Because we don't progress if we are hurting, my dear brothers and sisters. And I've seen in the church of the past, ever since the Lord dropped me in that hypocrisy, that something was happening in the back of mine and of the church. Something was happening from credible people Character assassination was happening. False representation and false accusations was happening in the body of Christ. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get right with God. Repent of your sin and get restored in the presence of God. Otherwise, there is a great fiery indignation waiting for you. Don't do something that will hurt the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Don't hurt the body of Christ. Because there is too much of persecution from outside. Don't persecute them from within. And so it is very, very important, my dear brothers and sisters. We smell the coffee, roll, roll up our sleeves and mend our ways so that we will live in accordance to God's word. Then it says traitors, verse 4. Traitors. They're traitors. Eating with you, betraying you. Okay, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. <laughs> Having a mask of godliness. They look holy, they talk holy, they talk in tongues, they move in the operates in the gift of the spirit, probably hit and miss prophecies. And you say, wow, that sister prophesied for me, sister. Part came to pass, part did not come to pass. That's a false prophet. If part prophecies come to pass and part does not come to pass, he's a false prophet. In the Old Testament, that prophet must be stoned to death. That's what the Bible says. And it's the same in the New Testament as well. The only thing is because of this new era and new modern age that we are living, we are not stoning them to death. But if you go to Iran or Iran or Saudi Arabia or other places like that, if you have sinned a sin against the monarchy, if you have sinned a sin against and you have the brother, you will be cut, your hand will be cut if you're stolen. Your members will be decapitated or you'll be stoned to death. It still happens. 
But we have taken the church, the grace of Jesus so lightly and so casually that there is zero, zero, nada, fear of God in our hearts. Right? And we have taken the grace of God so casually. Hyper grace movements. Oh, God still loves you. No, sir, he still, he loves you, but he's angry with you. His wrath is coming upon you. Repent, get right. You are not coming to his presence. He does not give you the audience in his presence because he's angry with you. Yes, you are his son and his daughter. And he anticipates that you will move off from your sinning ways and come back and get restored into that beautiful fellowship and have that signet ring again that you had lost. The ring of authority, the ring of power, the ring to, do, to exercise your authority. My dear brothers and sisters, that you are the child of the and the son and the daughter of the most high God. So he says, from such turn away, right? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They talk godly, they preach godly, they speak godly, they prophesy godly, they look godly, they act godly, but they deny the power of the gospel that has the power to change their hearts and change their minds, my dear brothers and sisters. We must be careful. And we must be watchful. In verse 13 he says. But evil men and seducers. Sorcerers. Seducers. That is why Paul was writing to the church in Galatians. In Galatia. Who has bewitched you? That means who has cast a spell on you. It's not somebody outsider. A heathen is not casting a spell. There is no voodoo. There is no magic that can come from outside. But people from within are casting a spell. That you will not walk rightly. That you will not be the member of the church. That you will start thinking. You will st stay in a state of confusion. Why? Because you have swallowed a deceptive. And the, and the doctrines of the demons. From within. You have swallowed it. Because it was very tasty to you. It was like gutta gut snack. Or it was like that crispy. You know chips. That was having, having nice pungent you know taste and you keep eating keep eating keep eating because tasting nice to your mouth my dear brothers and sisters both the ones who speak slander and receive slander are equally condemned my dear brothers and sisters therefore we must be very watchful in these entangled but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving they are deceiving others and in the process are deceived themselves are you with me my dear brothers and sisters they live in a state of deception i'm talking about the born again church and that's the status of the church worldwide today people are being deceived and they live in deception by their own people because they wanted to move in the supernatural without having a firm foundation of the word of god let's go to titus chapter 1 verses 15 to 16 Titus chapter 1, 15 to 16. What he's saying, again, he talks, you read all these chapters in, 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 in comprehension, like the whole chapter. It'll give you a full feedback because I'm running out of time. I don't have all the time to explain to you. But let's go. Unto the pure, all things are pure. <laughs> but unto them that are defiled, unto them that are defiled. Now he's talking outside. He's not talking to the heathens. He's talking to the ones in the church who became defiled. They were pure, but now they're defiled. Are you with me? The seed of bitterness has gone and the root has taken place. Now the bitterness is coming out and instead of being pure and holy, defilement is coming. Unbelief is coming out. Nothing is pure in their eyes. They sit in an environment of doubt and despair. If you are that person right now in the church sitting in a cloud of despair and doubt, get that despair out. Take off that veil of confusion. Start looking clearly by the spectacles of the Holy Ghost and say, God, give me vision that I will know the truth and I will live by the truth. The Bible said, Jesus said in 832, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you have not got the truth from the leaders, if you have not got the truth from your brothers and sisters, if you have not got the truth from your familiar friend who has eaten with you and now backstabbed you, go to the pastor, go to the word, search for yourself and have a conversation. I promise you that veil will be removed and you'll become pure once again.
So unto the pure, all things are pure. Why you have remained pure? Because you have shut your ears to everything that is evil spoken by your nearest, dearest friends. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, the Bible says, what it says, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. It's done deal. Their conscience is defiled. Their mind is defiled. They are polluted, contaminated. Their anointing is contaminated. So your familiar friend who has betrayed you did it because his anointing, which was pure and holy earlier. That is why he did not fear to eat with David. He did not fear to talk to David. He did not fear to do anything with David. Are you with me? He was his close friend, but now he has become defiled and he's tattering and tarnishing the character and the reputation of David. If you go to verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works, they deny him. Your profession of your faith and the working of your faith is like two railway track that takes the train into its destination. Are you with me? They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient. Being abominable and disobedient. And unto every good work, reprobate. Wow, reprobate. Unuseful. Of no use. Their minds have gone back. They're defiled. They're contaminated. Yes. Once they were anointed. Yes, Saul was once anointed. But when he sinned, a demon started to hurt him. And so anointed David would come and play the harp. And the demons would come out from Saul. But because Saul did not repent, that demon took him to his death. And he died a horrible death. My dear brothers and sisters, that was the end of Saul. And my dear brothers and sisters, we as Amazing Grace Church... Cannot take the grace of God for granted. Let us repent of our sin. And say God have mercy upon us. Because we don't want to live in that scenario at all. Right? Now he's not talking some false teaching. False this thing. These are your people. Your people. With whom you mingle. With whom you are intricately involved. You say hello. Hi. Praise the Lord. How are you brother sister? Doing well. All is well. Praise the Lord. Right? These are the praise the Lord speaking ones. Who are behind the scenes doing harm to you let's go to 2 john chapter 1 verse 9 2 john 1 9 very quickly whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of christ hath not god right whoever transgresseth he's writing to the church again apostle john and abideth not in the doctrine of god in the teachings of christ you have been taught Last 20 years in Amazing Grace Church, you have been taught. Or whenever you have joined Amazing Grace, you have been taught. And in this church, we will teach you. We will teach you the true word of God. We don't teach the diluted word of God. And many people get offended. Many people have left the church. They've gone to look for people who, you know, can give them Lara Lapa stories, fables, mythologies. They are movie shows. Hollywood. Dancing, chanting, revolving, want to do something, some action. My dear brothers and sisters, if your foundation is not strong, no action will occur. If your foundation is strong, miracles will automatically happen. Don't run after the supernatural, run after God, run after the word of God, run after the character of God and the will of God. And I promise you, you will never be the same. You will be transformed. Let's go quickly. What it says, had not God, he that abided in the doctrine of Christ, he had both the father and the son. What is the doctrine of Christ? Oh man, doctrine of Christ. If I have to ask you, what is the doctrine of resurrection? What is the doctrine of baptism? What is the doctrine of Christ? Will you be able to tell me? If you can praise the Lord, then live by it. Hallelujah. Then you will have both the father and the son. They will come and dine. Come and dine, the master's calling. Come and dine. You'll come and dine. God will come and dine with you. Why? Because you're holy. You will eat with the anointed one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Talk with the anointed one. The anointed Messiah will come and he will dine with you. 
He will give you an audience to you, personal audience, private audience, public audience. He will certify your life and your ministry. So the question is very quickly, how are we going to keep ourselves from such men and women who are in the church? <laughs> very dangerous, right? Very sorry to know that they are in the church. But how do we deal with those people? What do we have to do? How can we keep ourselves still pure and holy? Because now they were once holy, but now they have turned away from the truth. They were once following the truth, but now they have gone away to fables. Right? Two things I will lay with you from the scriptures. What Paul was mentoring his prodigy, Timothy. Okay? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12 to 16. Very quickly. And then we'll pray. Let no man despise thy youth. Because he was a young pastor. He was not 15, 16, 17. He was between 35 and 40 years of age. He was still called a youth. <laughs> and he was called a boy in Greek terminology. All right. But be thou an example of the believers in word. Examples. Tell your neighbor example. In what? In word. In conversation. In charity. In spirit. In faith. In purity. Five things. Five is the number of grace. Very quickly. Say in word. Say in conversation. Say in charity, that is in love. Say in spirit, that means you will have a humble spirit, a teachable spirit. If you see the in spirit, the Greek translation, it is a teachable heart. In spirit, in faith, and in purity. Five things important for the man of God and the woman of God to maintain his purity in the house of God, which may be polluted, which may have contaminated souls. Are you with me? But today is the day of redemption. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of forgiveness. Today is the day of new beginnings. Today is the day of final day of Sukkot. Let's become together with the Lord God Almighty. Let there be joy in the house of God. Why? Okay. Then he says further down, till I come give attendance to reading. Say reading. To exhortation. Say exhortation. And to doctrine. Say doctrine. Three things. Till I come. Paul is saying, wait, hold on. Till I come to equip the church further. You will give attendance to reading. That means in your personal life, you will read the word every day. You will study the word every day. You will meditate upon the word every day. You will also memorize the word. To exhortation, you will exhort yourself and exhort one another. And to doctrine. Then he says further down, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Praise the Lord. Neglect not the gift. How? Uh, that is upon thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. You were ordained to be a leader. You were blessed. There was words of prophecy given to you. Gifting was imparted to you. Do not neglect it. Operate in it. Practice it. That's what he's saying. Then he says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Completely. Spirit, soul, mind, body, everything. 100%. You will give yourself into the word. 100%. That means 24 by 7. Your mind will meditate upon the word. 24 by 7. Yes, you will say, Pastor, I've got a job. And I've got business. Yes, sir. I also too have my business. And I also have to run errands. And I have also, I have to be, I am very busy these days. Very, very busy. I was working till late last night. But what I'm trying to tell you is that <clears throat> God wants to, Bless you that your spirit man will be agile, alive, speaking in tongues, meditating upon the word, peace of God coming upon your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Remember that. So he's saying that very categorically, meditate upon the instinct. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Are you profitable? To all the amazing grace church is a question. Right? Profitable. Are you profitable? Am I profitable? Now, so pastor, I don't have an opportunity to be proud. No, sir, you can. Bring in the fruit of souls. Win them. Bring in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's profitability. Your fruit, good fruit. Show it. Let it emerge. Let people eat out of it. And I promise you that you will become a blessing. You'll be fruitful. Are you fruitful? Are you bringing souls into the house of God? Or are you telling them to go out from the church? What are you telling? Are you producing? Or are you not producing? Or are you thinking wrong because you are defiled and polluted and contaminated in your anointing? And so therefore we must be careful. The is saying you must be profiting may appear to all. You're profiting. Timothy, you're profiting. You're a pastor of the church. All the people in the church should be blessed by you. 
same about you you are the priesthood of god you are the holy nation of god the entire church must be blessed by you are you a blessing think about it let's go further down 16 take heed unto thyself and uh, what are you saying unto the doctrine <laughs> take heed protect yourself protect from these tattlers who are trying to seduce your mind you know pastor you know that ministry though you know the gold dust is falling oh the oil is coming from the bible oh the angel appeared some entity there has come now they, they have to talk you know the demons show up they call it an entity or they call it a personality that is what is happening in the occult realm and the occult has penetrated the church my dear brothers and sisters, divination has come into the church. They'll tell you a house address, the phone number, where you're living, your wife's name, your children's name, everything they'll tell you. Why? What? Nowhere has, you know, it, it, it occurs like that. It may have once in a while, but let me tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, that's not what we are called to do. We are not called to be governed by the supernatural. We are, gov we are called to be governed by the word of God. So what Paul is telling him, hey, take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine, protect it. Fight for it. Contend for it, Jude says. Contend for the faith. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Wow. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to save myself and I also want to save you because you are hearing me. And I need to see salvation thrive and flourish in your life. And corporately is amazing grace church globally that the name of Jehovah will be glorified. That's one aspect. That's what Paul is telling his son uh, Timothy. Let's go to the another scripture and then we'll end. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 14 to 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 14 to 19. You must read these chapters in context because we are all seasoned people. We must Study the word of God. He says, to, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. That means do not, huh? but to the subverting of the hearers. I mark that, underline that. What they are doing? Striving about words to no profit. They jangle the words, they'll dangle the words, the genealogies, histories, laws, this to be kept, that to be kept, Scientology, okay, all those things. And they are doing what? Subverting the hearers. Or they are slandering and subverting the hearers. They are falsely accusing and subverting the hearers. A familiar friend is subverting the people who held David in good reputation. Are you with me? Then he says in verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Your certificate of approval will come by studying the word of God. If you have not joined LCU, Life Christian University, now is the time to join. My dear brothers and sisters, you will be equipped and you'll be blessed. So he's commanding him, study to show thyself approved unto God. What he's saying? Has it not passed the seminary? Yes. He was in the best seminary. Timothy was mentored, coached, taught by Apostle Paul himself. Hallelujah. One on one. Can you imagine? One on one. The highest price paid. And so he says there, a workman needed that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You don't skew the word. You don't say, you know, oh, Apostle Paul told Timothy here only later down, drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. That's a pastor. I'm having beer. I'm having some wine. I go to the pub and I go to the club. I dance a little and I, you know, Get a little high also sometimes, sometimes tipsy-turvy also. Because, you know, Jesus turned the water into wine in the marriage ceremony. No, sir. That's not what he's calling to do. Rightly dividing the word of truth. When you study the word yayin from Genesis down to Revelation of the word wine, the word very categorically say that Jesus was from the sect of the Essenes. He did not touch alcohol at all. Are you with me? So let's, now I'm not going there. Please forgive me because I don't want to deviate from the word on hypocrisy. But what I'm saying is little wine. So let's drink. No, no, don't skew the word and make a doctrine out of it. That's why we have got so many denominations. Why? Because you took what pleased you and created a cult out of it. Please don't create cults 
in Amazing Grace Church create a living organism of the Lord Jesus Christ that believes from Genesis down to Revelation, lives by the full gospel of Jesus Christ. By the power of the word. Are you with me? So he says, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. The one vain babblings is taken from the uh, Greek word beblos. Beblos was referred to dung, which was thrown on the street and people trampled over it. So he's saying, shun profane, terrible, dirty words, evil words, negative words. Shun it. Vain babblings, bickerings. The word babblings comes from the uh, Greek Hebrew uh, Greek word uh, bickering. There's bickering among you. So shun it. Reject it. Rebuke it. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. When you keep living and your life in an environment of bickering, negativity, you become polluted and you become like them, those who are trying to take you away from the truth of the word of God. Wayne babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. What will happen? Ungodliness will increase in the church. He's not talking about outside. <laughs> He's talking church. Can you imagine? It will increase ungodliness. And when ungodliness is increased, what happens? The wrath of God comes. Are you with me? So before the wrath could hit, we must repent. Get right. Align ourselves completely to the word of God. Verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker. The word canker comes from the Greek word cancer. Gangrene. When gangrene comes into your body, the doctors have got no option. There is no cure. You have to cut that organ out. Are you with me? Right? The word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenus and Philetus. He names them. He names and shames them. In Amazing Grace Church, we don't name you and shame you. We know who the betrayers are. We know who talk against our back. We don't do that because we honor you, respect you, love you. Are you with me? Jesus loved Judas. He still washed his feet. Anticipating a restoration, anticipating a repentance, anticipating a response. But it did not happen. But we urge you, brethren, let not your words become cancer in the church, gangrene in the church, of whom was Hymenus. Later on in the book of Titus, you know what Paul says to this man, Hymenus? I give him over to Satan. He handed him over to Satan. Hymenus, a man who worked in the ministry. Man who was born again, Holy Spirit, moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Philetus, we don't know much about him. But he was handed over to Satan. He was mentioned in the word. We don't mention your name. Does not mean that you take it for granted and lightly. Repent of yourself. I'm speaking to the people and those who are doing that in the house of God. Please repent and turn from your wicked ways. That God will have mercy upon you and upon the church worldwide. Who concerning the truth have heard, saying that the resurrection is past already. These are the people who are talking about false doctrine, false teaching. And then they were saying what? Saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, I like that scripture. Nevertheless, the foundation of God's standard show, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. God knows as the remnant. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God knows them who are his. Praise the Lord. Amen. Right? I've lost my verse here. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. The seal of God is upon you. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ in Amazing Grace Church worldwide. And every one of you who are watching us as guests from outside churches, depart from iniquity. It's a command. Depart from iniquity. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I command you the same. Depart from iniquity. My dear brothers and sisters. Right? Last scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 5. And then we'll pray. My time is up. Hallelujah. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Hallelujah. Be instant in season. Now hold there. Hold there for a minute. Let me give you 
an exposition on the preach the word. Let me tell you what that, that means. Okay, now pay careful attention to the word preach. This is the Greek word. Ketroxen, keroxon. This was not originally a Christian word at all. The word preach, keruxon, was the Greek word used to describe the spokesman of the emperor. Listen to this. A technical term for him would be the imperial herald. The man who had access to the throne room. He would go into the throne room and say, O king, what is your message for the people? He would listen to the words of the king and the king would give him a special message for the people. He would then leave the throne room of the king and would come out into the streets. A crowd would gather around him and he would speak on behalf of the king. Thus saith our king. He would begin and then he would say exactly what the emperor had said. This was the most noble position in government. This was the job that everyone wanted because you had access to the king. And not only that, you were his spokesman and spokeswoman. You were invested with such power that you could actually speak on behalf of the king. Wow. It was most notable and never, never did an imperial herald take his job lightly. My dear brothers and sisters, that is what the preach, the word preach actually means in Greek. Hallelujah. You are an imperial herald. Go preach the gospel. Jesus has commanded. Hallelujah. Don't preach vanity. Don't preach slander. Don't preach false accusation. Don't preach bickerings and complainings. Preach the gospel. That is what he's saying here. And the Bible is recording. That was the most notable thing you have ever done. Right? And never, never did an imperial herald take his job lightly. He understood that it was a privilege to be a spokesman for the king. What an honor to be the imperial herald. By using this word keruxon, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you need to understand the privilege that is attached to the preaching of the gospel. Don't ever take this lightly. You are the herald of the king. Herald of the king. You have a place in the throne room. You go in, you hear what he says, and you just, a few others, have the power to go out and speak directly from his throne. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? Preach the gospel. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove. What does the word reprove mean? Prove it again from the scriptures. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. With all long suffering. That means with patience and doctrine. Again record doctrine, 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 doctrine. What he's saying? He's not saying go do the supernatural work. No. He didn't say go raise the dead. No. He's saying stick to your post. When you're positioned as a pastor. When you're positioned as a believer. When you're positioned as a leader. Stick to your post. Don't throw in your towel. Don't give up as if your ghost has gone. Fight till the end, my dear brothers and sisters. Fight till the end. That is what Apostle Paul was saying. I fought my, I have run the race. I have fought the, my fight of faith and I have done my job. I have accomplished the task. Hallelujah. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, the Bible says. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Oh, you know. Pastor Samuel's word is too harsh. Let's go try some other word. In amazing grace, I got saved. In some other grace, I got delivered. Or something will happen to me. No, sir. If you can't get delivered under the true teaching and the preaching of the word of God, nowhere else can you get delivered. Are you with me? Deliverance is here, right now, right here. In the presence of God. You'll get healed and delivered from the sin of hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite, critical Christian. Right? He says, for the time will come. This is the time. They will not endure sound doctrine. <laughs> and do what? But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. Stories. Hollywood clips. Some other, uh, you know, things that will attract them. 
Today we have become so self-seeking, seeking the laws and pleasing their flesh that we have stopped preaching the true gospel of the word to them. They are still messy, still living in unholiness, still looking, reading the stories and are happy about the stories that they hear. And they go back home dull and dry and dead as they had come into the church. My dear brothers and sisters, but watch now in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. The word evangelist is not a Christian word. In the Greek, it was called an oracle. Later on, it became a Christian word. It was called an oracle. Be an oracle of Christ, a mouthpiece of Christ. Make full proof of your ministry. My dear brothers and sisters, let me encourage you today. In the name of Jesus, if I'm bringing this teaching to you, is this, it is because I love you. I care about you. I don't want you to get perished or die in your sin. I desire that you will be holy. I desire that I will save myself and save you who are the hearers of the word of God. I will save myself as Paul was telling Timothy, save yourself and everyone who hears you will get saved. I pray this afternoon that your life will be saved by the power of the word by the power of the blood and by the power of the spirit. Let me tell you, I love you dearly. I love you dearly. Please don't take it in a wrong fashion, but take it. Don't be remorseful. If you are that person, man or a woman or a child or a youth who has been in a place of hypocrisy, slander, accusation, repent, repent. If you're seducing others to do evil, to listen to evil and you are becoming an, that seducing spirit, seducing the body of Christ, the innocent one or the elders or the leaders, you're seducing them and putting seeds of doubt in them. Let me tell you, the time has come that you must repent, must cling to the feet of Jesus, kiss his feet hundred times, say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, I need deliverance. And I promise you, today is the day of salvation. I told you, I have wished you happy Sukkot, tabernacle of God, the Mishkan of God. God desires to dwell with you, but he cannot dwell with you. You may be his son and his daughter. He'll keep you at a distance. You know why? Because you stink of your sin. There is a stench of sin comes. He cannot bring you close until you are bathed and washed and you have changed your robes of demonic principalities and powers and dirty clothes and taking the robes of righteousness, then only you have access into the father's chambers. My dear brothers and sisters, you know, when my children come to the bed and if they are, the armpits are stinking, you know, say, hey, get out, man. What are you doing? You're stinking. That's what we say, right? <laughs> right? That's what happens with God when you stink. You say, get out. Wash yourself. Get clean and then come. Perfume yourself with the oil of the Holy Ghost. That's what God wants, that we will change, bathe ourselves, get right with God and say, God, have mercy upon me. Lord, I will do everything to the unity of the faith in the body of Christ. That's what we are called. I'll be fruitful in the kingdom of God. And I promise you, this is the season of fruitfulness. Season, let's be fruitful. Let's grow the church. Let's multiply it. If today we are an X number, let us become double in size by end December. That's what I've told our Sharjah Life Group. Come on. Hallelujah, we'll become double the number by the end of December. Can we do that? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Come on. Father, we want to say thank you. We love you. We bless you. We worship you. We adore you. Lord, I pray you have called us to be aware of the seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons that operates in the church. I pray, Lord, we take authority over every demonic power that operates in the house of God. I bind it, I rebuke it, I cast it out in the name of Jesus. Every demon manifestation, every tattling voice and every hypocritical spirit that operates in the body of Christ that contaminates and pollutes the pure water for the innocent sheep. Lord, I ask of you, I rebuke that demonic spirit. Out in Jesus' name. Lord, and I release your Holy Spirit upon your church. I know that you're a gracious God. You're a merciful God. You're slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. I pray that your spirit of repentance will take over. And the spirit of discernment will take over. 
Both will operate today, O Lord, that we'll be able to repent if we have lent our ear to gossip. If we have taken it in our hearts and swallowed it in like morsels, forgive us, O God, those who have received it. And forgive them, those who have deliberately done it, either knowingly or unknowingly. Especially the ones who are the seasoned ones and they have done it deliberately. Forgive them, O God. Open their eyes of their understanding that their eyes will be open to the truth and the truth will set them free. Lord, forgive them, O Master. I forgive them in the name of Jesus, O Father. Lord of the church, leaders and elders, we forgive them in the name of Jesus. But Lord, I pray, have mercy that there'll be genuine, true repentance, that the name of Yeshua will be glorified. Your church will be cleansed, purified, purged, that in the season of new beginnings, we will see the Mishkan of God, that God will dwell in us, live in us, breathe in us, the fresh breath of the Holy Ghost, the fresh anointing of God, and fresh seasons of fruit bearing, that the name of Yeshua will be glorified. He'll work the work of an evangelist to being the oracle of God. And Lord will speak the word, preach the word. And Lord will continue to preach the word. Being the imperial herald of the emperor. The Lord of lords and the king of kings. The Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you and I give you the praise. Glory, honor, dominion, power and authority. Because it all belongs to you. Everyone, O oh Lord of the church members, I cover them under your blood. Everyone who's our guest, I cover them too under your blood. Bless all of us. Silver and gold have I none to give to your people. But as your servant, Lord, I bless them with the blessings of Abraham. As Abraham was rich in faith and cattle and gold and in silver, I pray that your church will be rich in every area of their life. Spiritually, physically, financially, materially, emotionally. Lord, I pray that you will bless them, O oh Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, O oh God. And let the name of Jesus be alone glorified. I pray for my brothers who are leaving the country and going back home because of no job available. I pray that, Lord, you will bless them. Be with them, O oh Father God. Those who are without jobs, you'll provide them jobs. Those who are without finances, provide them finances of God. Bless them, O oh God, because you're a God who will open out your uh, Lord heavens. And, Lord, there'll be showers of blessings upon your church. We thank you. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. We give you the praise, glory, honor, dominion, power, authority, because it all belongs to you. In Jesus' most holy, mighty, and matchless name we pray. Amen and amen. Now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of his sweet Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And all the saints of God said, amen and amen, amen.